Homage to the Buddha, homage to the Dharma, homage to the Sangha. Well, good evening, friends. Uh, so nice to have guests. I had that feeling like um, we have some special people coming over to dinner. <laughs> and uh, uh, lovely that you can uh, join us and perhaps um, benefit from the power of Sashin, one of the uh, strongest uh, methods or medicines that we have in Zen practice. And um, this is the first time we've done a spring session. As a farmer, of course, reticent to schedule anything this time of year, but uh, particularly as a farmer, what a wonderful way to celebrate the spring, to be still and to absorb it uh, before we enact its energies. That is probably the best way. Of course, this is our first full day of Sashin, and Sashin at once is incredibly simple. It sounds so easy. Just come back, relax, come back to the present, sit, work, clean, rest. And yet it is also uh, so hard. <laughs> it is so challenging. Uh, even though I'd farmed for many years, the first Sashin I did uh, after I finished, I said that was the hardest thing that I've done in my life. Uh, so uh, we practice and we never know what's going to come up. Uh, and of course, spring is a good metaphor for that. Uh, what's happening in the first day of Sashin. Sometimes the sky is blue and clear and other times a windy rainstorm comes through. Sometimes there are daffodils and hummingbirds in our mind and other times a bitter cold rain and sticky mud. And so it is um, at this session, Mishin and I are taking up a classical koan, uh, one that celebrates um, some of our most famous Chinese uh, Zen ancestors. We wanted to bring forth some, some core piece of our practice. And it's wonderful to get to know uh, the characters in this koan. And I want to say that for uh, those on Sashin, um, taking up a koan and entering Sashin have the same instructions. Uh, we must enter with the mind of not knowing, being open-handed and, and risking feeling a little stupid, <laughs> kind of bumbling over things and feeling a little inadequate. We have to take that risk when we enter the space for something much more valuable than preserving our comforts. And whenever, you know, say this about koan, whenever we're faced with some complex situation, which are most situations, sashin, question of birth and death, or ecological collapse, or the way our society is fragmenting, our own personal crises, the only way forward in those situations I've come to understand is to recognize them as koans. Anytime we're stumped or blocked and we say, what is this? How should I go forward? Uh, we should follow the koan way, which is a kind of surrender and to having faith, the capacity to wait. So the koan mind is uh, also wholehearted mind. And wholehearted mind is beginner's mind. And beginner's mind is the undefended heart. So we know these. So go to our koan, our exchange. I'm gonna take up the first section tonight. And then Mushin will elucidate the rest. <laughs> we are uh, meeting two characters, Nan Yue and Hui Nang. So I won't say much about Hui Neng because our group has been studying him in the Platform Sutra. But um, what's good to know about Hui Neng is that uh, he, uh, when he began his practice uh, and throughout his life, it's said that he was, um, uh, he could not read or write. He was not educated in that way. And yet he is one of the most renowned Zen masters we have. And in some ways it was to his disadvantage. So whenever we lament that we don't know enough Zen, 
we haven't studied enough or learned enough words, we can just look at Huineng and say, well, not so. But I'll introduce uh, Nanyue. Nanyue um, eventually becomes Huineng's Dharma heir, but we're going to catch Nanyue at a, his first meeting. Uh, his students, who are very famous Zen masters, his students was Masu. And uh, he was also associated with uh, Shitu, who wrote the um, Brass Roof Hermitage that we are uh, reciting during Sishin. And as a child, it was said he was sort of a very kind, exceptionally compassionate. You can see he already had an affinity for becoming a bodhisattva. And uh, when he was 11 years old, he only wanted to read Buddhist books. So somehow he was enlivened and drawn. Uh, he ordained when he was 15 years old. And then he ends up studying with um, a Vinaya teacher, which is the one referred to in this koan. The Vinaya, for those who might not know, uh, one of the earliest practices in um, Buddhism, there are a set of rules of monastic observations. There are 253 for men and 364 for women. That's another story. But um, basically they teach the body right, to observe certain uh, renunciate, um, renunciate tradition paths of which many are maintained currently uh, in the world. But um, Hui Neng, uh, sorry, Nan Yue, uh, even though he's gone to study with this Vanaya teacher, he is unsatisfied. And he's unsatisfied because he's been following the instructions diligently, but missing what the point of liberation is. Following the rules and instructions, but missing the point. So I'll um, read the section of the koan that I want to explore. It's a little shortened just for convenience. So Nanyue, he went to study with Wei Neng when he, after he was dissatisfied with his practice with the Vinaya teacher. So he goes to Wei Neng. And Wei Neng says to him, upon greeting, where are you from? And Nan Yue says, I came from the national teacher, who was the Vinaya teacher, common. And Wei Neng said, what is it that has come like this? Or another translation is, what, it is, what is it that thus comes? And it says in the koan, Nan Yue could not answer. He attended the master for eight years and worked on this question. And one day he said to Hui Neng, now I understand it. When I first came to study with you, you asked me, what is it that has come like this? And Hui Neng said, how do you understand it? And Nan Yue said, to say it's like something misses it. To say it's like something misses it. So I'll go to the back to the beginning because um, we are now walking uh, Hui Neng's path. Hui Neng uh, sought for many years through another practice. And how many of us seek and have tried many, many paths to liberation by the time we've reached the doors of Sun. I know I did looking in places where what I wanted would not be found. Places perhaps that had instructions, if you only do these three easy steps, these things will happen. <laughs> there was a big pile of dusty self-help books on my shelves when I entered practice, along with a nice spackling of new age spirituality and other other types of paths that did not satisfy, that wore thin. And in the koan, it says that, um, that uh, Nan Yue went to study with Hui Neng. But all this is very shorthand. At this time in China, uh, it would have been an arduous journey to go from monastery to monastery. 
no casual travel like we do where, oh yeah, I just hop in another Zen center and spend a weekend there and see what's up. Uh, in some ways you might be leaving all and never return to where you left. Friendships, family, and you travel uh, long dusty roads, perhaps even uh, risking theft or violence to seek guidance, to seek something very important to you. And this is true of all the ancestors that we have inherited from these old times. So here we are uh, following Hoi Neng's travels in our own modern way we have uh, forded the arduous journey of the pandemic to be here in this Zoom zone. And we can look and see how we are arriving at this gate of Seshin in the way that Nanyue arrived at Hui Neng's gate. What is it that we are entering with? How do we approach like Nanyue? approach the teacher. Hui Neng uh, was quite famous and I imagine for Nanyue that was no small matter to go up and talk to him. How do we come forward with what we really care about? What are our hopes? And I ask that question to encourage to really look into those hopes even if a voice is saying, ah, oh, I shouldn't have any gaining idea, to put that aside and really examine what it is we want. What did Nanyue want? What did he fear? What did he have to overcome to rally his determination to travel and seek the truth? What doubts did he encounter? Our koan does not say, but I know where to get this information directly. And to find out, just look in your own heart. And there Nanyue will be. This is a wonderful exchange between teacher student. I like it because actually it's not kind of fancy. A lot of uh, Zen exchanges have a little bit of a bizarreness to them, but this one does not. It's subtler than that. And I like it for that. Huineng, the teacher, starts with a very ordinary question that uh, I would start with in our Zendo or any of us when someone comes and joins us. Where are you coming from? Oh yeah, I've been to Zen Mountain Monastery and I did some uh, Vipassana retreats and had a, stayed at Naropa for a year. Right? It's an ordinary exchange. What's your experience? But there's a little bit more subtlety going on here because what's not said in print is that uh, Hui Nang sees into Nanyue's brightness. He sees that this student has something churning and moving along and decides to ask him another question after that seemingly ordinary question, a little more odd one. What is it that thus comes? What is it? And in some ways it repeats the same theme You'll see this over and over in the koans. Because one day, many years ago, Hui Neng, the young 20 year old, went to his teacher, famous Hongren, and also said, Hongren said to him, to Hui Neng, Why are you here? What are you doing here? And uh, Hui Neng was bold enough to say, to realize great awakening. And Dong Grand pressed him, he said, well, that's a lot of big talk from someone from, from the backwoods. But uh, Hoi Neng would not be swayed. He said, you and I have the same Buddha nature. Right? And so the teacher knew that this was a serious, bright student. But then he proceeded to put him in the kitchen. Again, another story. 
But I want to say that as I read this now, um, after sitting in both seats of teacher and student, I want to unpack this question. There is a lot rolled into Hui Nang's question, what the teacher is asking. And there are things I ask, uh, perhaps in little drops here and there, with the same eye. The teacher is asking, who are you? How do you see yourself? What do you believe about awakening? What's your intention? What ideas are you carrying about practice? What do you think your obstacle is? What's your real obstacle? Have you encountered your own true nature? Have you seen it? Where do you think you're going? And where have you already looked? All those questions are in the teacher's question right in that moment. But here's a beautiful part we could miss. So most of us, when we're students, we think he didn't have the answer. Oh my God, what shame. Right, the kind of, uh, I was stumped, but actually it's brilliant. And it speaks to his maturity, Nanyue's. It says Nanyue cannot answer. But what's missing there is, is the fact that he didn't try to fudge. He didn't try to say something that wasn't true for him, like we are wont to do, and I have been wont to do. He doesn't equivocate. In the first one, he gave a concrete answer. Yes, I've been to the national teacher. That's where I've studied, very practical. But then he sees that the teacher's not just asking him a common question. He's asking him about his heart, his mind. So it's quite dignified to be silent and to realize you don't know. In fact, I've, uh, in training people to do Mondo and uh, upcoming Hosens, I always wish them, may you be asked a question you can't answer. You'll never forget it. <laughs> what a gift. So Nanyue is given a great gift by Hui Neng. And uh, quite, quite subtly. And in the silence, the teacher saying in that instance, well, why don't you find out? These questions are asked over and over again in one form or another between every teacher and student from the beginning. Even uh, Bodhidharma, who was uh, quite realized, the same question was asked of him by Emperor Wu. Who is it before me? What is this? Bodhidharma says, I don't know. But actually, a more accurate translation is not knowing. Not knowing stands before you. But Bodhidharma could say that because he'd already realized it. And Nanyue still had some clarification. So it says, Nanyue worked on this for eight years. And I liked Mushin's tone. <laughs> eight years? <laughs> How patient would we be with a question for eight years? We, tr we tried like seven other Zen centers before we sat with one question. Impatient as we are, I include myself. So it's a nagging question that uh, Nanyue stays and trains with his uh, new teacher, Wai Neng. And of course we have these all the time. It's not just one question. How many questions have we encountered in practice that we're just kind of percolating? What, what, what was that? Even if we gave an answer, weren't quite satisfied with it. I don't understand that. Those are rich. It's something we don't get at the time. Almost everything I heard in Zen was like that when I first came. Every talk was like, what is that? I don't get that. But it stuck with me. And I think um, sometimes I think a little arrogance goes a long way because I was determined to find out. <laughs> and I thought I could if I tried hard enough. <laughs> I wanted to find out. And interestingly enough, Hui Neng uh, uh, has it. He has the answer actually. He has the mind that seeks the way when he's before, um, sorry, Nan Yue when Nanyue is before Hui Ning as a student. But he has to clarify what he's doing and why. I heard a talk the other day by um, 
uh, Shugan Arnold of uh, Zen Mountain Monastery. And he said something, uh, I just like the way he said it. He said, it's really not enough for us to come to practice just to want to be free from pain. Although most of us do, but it's not enough. He said something like, I like the way he, he said it. We have to be motivated to find out what it is that we're in the midst of. <laughs> what is it we're in the midst of? What is this life? Who am I? What's mine to do? So we should not be satisfied with just a little relief from practice, although relief, of course, comes. That will not um, satisfy ultimately. So Nanyue is practicing this koan for eight years. What is it that thus comes? But I guarantee you, he wasn't ruminating over it discursively. He wasn't Googling it. He wasn't probably even carrying it like the koan mu. He was living it out. And in some ways, because he has insight into the question eight years later, we cannot really say that Nanyue gets credit for the response. He's practicing for eight years with his Sangha and his teacher, day after day after day. Who is it that responds with the insight? It's the whole. It's the eight years. Not one moment too soon or too late. It is the fruit. Because insights that he shares with uh, Huineng, that what Nanyue shares, come unbidden. They are percolating unconsciously because we are living from the koan, because we are aligned with the motivation. And we can say that if anything about Nanyue, he allowed himself to be pulled and turned in the practice of enlightenment. As Dogen says in Bendua, to be pulled and turned it meant he allowed influence and he stopped practicing for rules as a technique to get him something and instead allowed himself to be changed. And in that process, the answer to this koan he carried emerged. So he says to the teacher, basically, I've had some realization. Remember that question you asked me? And um, to be fair, I'm surprised it didn't say something like Huang Neng said, what question? <laughs> I don't remember that question. So many, how many exchanges had they had eight years later? But he didn't. He said, oh, please tell me. And he says, it's not like something. It's not like something. That's the title of this whole koan. What's he saying? He's saying, if I try to bring it out, if I try to bring it out to show you like a piece of paper, like here it is, instantly it's gone. I've lost it. He is on to something. He really sees that the comparing mind with which we commonly seek, the mind that reads and has concepts and ideas and explanations moves us further from it. Words cannot reach it. So he says, it cannot have words. That's what he's saying. It does not have words. Today, on um, uh, we went for a walk, part of our practice in the afternoon. So I, I decided to, Mushin said, be very simple. So that was a good plan. I just walked the borders of the farm. So I didn't have to think where I was going to go. And I was coming back from the Zendo field. And it's a field of uh, red dead nettles and uh, mustard that's blooming, kind of sort of uh, in the grasses. and sunny out and there was a kind of scent and um right in that instant i realized i wanted to say something about it but there were no words if i said oh it smelled like there was no like anything there was just the scent of these red dead nettle flowers not compared to anything else or how about when you drink a glass of water Someone says, what's that like? Oh, it's like, 
uh, it's like drinking water. <laughs> what is, what is it? Or love, what's that like? The truth is imminent and immediate. It is not like something. So we each have to sit with this koan phrase. It's not like something. There are many exchanges that point to this one simple truth that's repeated over and over in Zen. There's a, a exchange, I don't know where it's from, it stuck with me as a new student, where the student says to the teacher, where is it? And this teacher says, you just missed it. <laughs> you just missed it. When I go in my head to go find it, I've just missed it. So what's to do? And that's for each of us to find out. Dido Lori's uh, commentary. So it, for those who have this koan, um, the passage is um, Dido Lori's words, which are quite beautiful. I really enjoy his voice. He says about this piece in the call on this exchange, the wisdom that has no teacher pervades the whole universe, reaching everywhere. The wisdom that has no teacher. When it's truly seen, you go deaf, dumb, and blind. What is there to compare it to? How can it be expressed? Indeed, how can it be understood? Take off the blinders and set down the backpack. Wisdom with no teacher. We should be very interested in this. This is what moved Nanyue to walk the dusty path to find Huineng. When I was in an undergraduate school, I remember backpacks. I had uh, one of those big, and I, this was before computers in the age called the 80s. And so uh, we had books, <laughs> big fat books. <laughs> if you had five classes that day, you had have all these big five fat textbooks. So remember the weight of that backpack. I probably had like a, you know, fat tome of dynamics and equilibrium Introduction to Abnormal Psychology, uh, a, a soft bound Shakespeare, maybe a little Alan Watts thrown in for the breaks, and um, you know, some, some others, notebooks. That was really heavy backpack. And for some reason, my memory, I don't know why, but it was really uncool to put it on the right way with both straps on your shoulders. If you're cool, you had it on one side and you just kind of hang off, which is really unbalanced. So I walk around with it on one shoulder and then put it on the other shoulder and then carry it on the side. Right. And probably a, a half eaten candy bar in there is all I could afford for lunch. Set down the backpack. What does it mean when Dido Lori just says to set down the backpack? What's in our backpack? What's in yours? Really fat text on shoulds and shouldn'ts of Zen. What one should look like. Although I was introduced, I'm thankful to someone in my Dyson group. Um, what I wanna call is there's a book of predictions and predictions like a horoscope based on your type, whether you'll succeed or not. Right. That's in our backpack. Let's see, I'm a Sagittarius and well, we'll probably won't experience great realization. Yeah, we can get rid of that one. That's kind of heavy. All the distractions, maybe a few emergency numbers, uh, escapes. Hmm. Set down the backpack. Or I don't know, I don't often remember it from memory, but the grassroof hermitage says the same thing. Let go of thousands of years of what conditioning can't remember its language. Let go of thousands of years. Open your hands and trust. Yeah, Huineng, um, 
Wei Neng is very gentle teacher. He's powerful in his uh, platform sutra, but you really get a sense of his love uh, for Nan Yue in this. Because he does accept his answer that words won't cat words words will not uh, capture it. I can't give you words. It's not like something. But he does uh, not let him off the hook. He does test Nan Yue further because that's too easy. It's too easy to say I don't have words. He wants to say what does that mean? And so uh, Huai Neng's response is provisional. He says, okay, but here's the thing. And I'm going to leave it for Mu Shen and pick up that go on tomorrow, should she so choose. <laughs> but I want to close with this, as here we are in Sashim. Each of us are some version of Nan Yue. We're not really that fundamentally different. We've traveled a long way to get here in life. We've suffered, loved, lost, tried lots of stuff. And how we enter the gate, how are we entering gate? Maybe our clothes are a little torn and tattered, a little tired and achy or irritated, ready for a nap. But here we are, having taken this time to explore what Hui Neng realized and all ancestors after him. And as soon as we sit down, you, we, you and I, meet Hui Neng face to face, who says, Who's the, who has thus come? Who are you? Zazen says, what are you about? What's in your heart of hearts? Hui Neng is Zazen. And we have a choice and perhaps we ebb and flow between these choices. One choice is to hedge our bets and play it safe. And the other choice is to allow practice to influence us, to be pulled and turned in the practice of enlightenment, to be pulled and turned, to be led. It's beautiful. And here's the um, icing on the cake for me, that uh, I'm discovering things anew as I enter this koan as well. And there was a lovely moment where I saw that even though Nan Yue answers Wei Neng with words, even though he says to him, words won't need it. Uh, his answer has already been fully received by the teacher uh, from the whole body. It can't be hidden. Your answer can't be hidden. One cannot hide in Zen. Hui Neng's whole practice up until that moment when he asks, sorry, Nan Yue's practice when he asks Hui Neng is fully there. There's not a, an ounce missing. How could it be? And it's in this realization when you see into this that our practice is always whole and complete right in this moment. We are exactly right where we are. There's nothing missing. And that was true for Nan Yue, but he couldn't see it. But Hui Neng could see it. It was already answered. The koan was already answered. We are exactly right where we are. It's not like something this moment is not like something, not like something else. And you are not like something else. I am not like something else. You are not like something else. <laughs>